take your Bibles tonight uh, to two passages of Scripture to start with. One is Exodus chapter 22, and the other is uh, um, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 1. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, we have several different passages of Scripture tonight, and, uh, and I'm honest with you, I don't think this message will last too long, but I do think it's uh, what God wants me to preach tonight. And uh, uh, Exodus chapter 22, verse number 2, and everybody there say amen. I won't want to take off here. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you being here tonight, and uh, I want you to, I want to continue on this series of messages on a journey toward biblical manhood, journey toward biblical manhood. I, uh, verse number two, the Bible said, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. Back after Noah had gotten off the ark, God ordained capital punishment uh, that was uh, available to civil governments. God ordained capital punishment. But God also ordained personal protection. And I want to preach tonight just uh, for a little bit on two things. One, the first is... Uh, a journey into biblical manhood is a journey into the ability to know when to draw your sword. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 13 that uh, he beareth not, we're talking about those in authority, particularly here speaking about, we might say, policemen or uh, people in a, in a uh, position of authority that way, that they bear not the sword in vain. They bear not the sword in vain. And now, sword was used uh, to kill people with. That's just the plain and simple thing about it. Swords weren't used as decorations. If I'd have had one, I'd have brought one with me tonight. Uh, I thought about calling a couple, three of you to see if you had, that I thought might have one. But, you know, you pull a sword out tonight, and you're talking, when you pulled your sword in the Bible, this is serious business. We're talking about somebody dying, and we're talking about it being a serious, serious matter. It's an interesting study in the Bible that the Bible teaches, there's, it gives, and we'll show this to you pretty soon, there's a place and a time when God taught young men, or they should have known when to pull the sword and to use the sword. And the first place I want to say tonight that we need as biblical men to know when and how to draw the sword is in the protection of our homes and our families. I'm talking about that the principle, this principle of biblical manhood was put into the Constitution of our country, better known as the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. And part of the right to bear arms, primarily in the Second Amendment, was about uh, defending ourselves against tyrannical governments. But the second application of it was, was to be able to protect our people and our property. In this passage of Scripture, it says a thief, someone who is getting ready to take your property, But you know, if he breaks into your house like he's talking here, you don't know whether he's just taking property or that in the process of taking your property, he may attempt to kill you. Our papers and our newscast are filled every day with stories of people whose homes have been broken into, uh, women who have been raped, children who have been killed. And we have a government and and a religious political philosophy going on in this nation that wants to disarm the people of America. When we say that we were founded on biblical principles, one of those principles we mean is the Second Amendment, that we want a people who are armed and who have the decency and the righteousness to protect their own people. I want to tell you tonight, it is not wrong for you to own a gun. In fact, I would say to you, it is wrong for you not to own a gun. For you not to own a gun in this day and age says that you don't care about your wife. You don't care about your children. You could care less. And I want to encourage you, and don't you let yourself be swayed by these liberal idiots who are getting on there and talking about how that we ought to do away with guns and do away with ammo. I'm telling you something. If Lord be in will, in about 20 or 30 days, we're going to have an ammo machine making ammunition so we can arm everybody in the country with it. I'm telling you something. You need to be stocked, not only for personal protection of uh, criminals and people like that. But what if we do have a government that goes crazy? And it looks like they are. It looks like they are. And I'll tell you, the only thing that will stand between them and tyranny is an armed people. But I say to you tonight that you need to be armed. I bought my uh, daughters and, and my wife uh, judge pistols here a couple of years ago for Christmas. You know what? They have a slug in them and they've got pellets in them. They don't have to hit it. They don't, all they've got to do is be aiming in the general direction and they go splatter somebody. 
And you say, Reg, you really mean that? Yes, I really mean that. There is no Christianity. There is no biblicalness about a person who will not defend his wife, who would not defend his children from somebody breaking into their house. Oh, I know you're spiritual and you're super spiritual and you're going to, you're going to talk to them about Jesus and talk them all out of it. Let me tell you what you're ignorant of. The fact that man is a depraved creature and there is evil in this world. And there are people right now that don't live very far from you who would break into your house if they thought you didn't have a gun. If they thought you wouldn't defend your family, they'd break in while you're at church here tonight. I was broken into on a Sunday night while I was here at church, had 33 guns stolen, broke into our house, went through every drawer in the house. I'm going to tell you that's not a good feeling. And I'm saying to you that we have an obligation and a duty and a right to draw the sword when somebody breaks into our house or someone who threatens our life. I don't want my daughters in Springfield or Mountain Grove or any other place being harassed by some thug who happens to think he's smart and cocky and sees a girl without somebody around to protect her or a woman. And, uh, and I want her to be able to pull a pistol out and blow him into hell. And I don't want anybody to go to hell, but I'm telling you something, I sure don't want her hurt either. And if you believe different than that, then you have been just influenced by the liberals to a bad point. I'm not out for killing anybody. I hope I never in my life have to kill anybody. I don't want to. I hope I never have to shoot at the first person. I don't want to. I pray, God, that would never happen. But let me tell you something tonight. I do have a pistol right within arm reach of my, where I'm laying in my bed. I do have a shotgun that's about that long that hit anything coming through the door right by my bed. Uh, I will say to you this, that we need to be very careful. We don't need to be smart heads. We don't need to be catty. We don't need to be braggy. Nothing of that nature. But I'm telling you something. If I can, I'm going to prevent somebody from killing my wife and family. I'm going to prevent them from doing damage to our home. And biblical manhood means that you have the responsibility to protect your family and draw the sword when necessary to do so. Don't hesitate. Now, now listen to me. I'm going to use a word tonight that you need to get a hold of. And that word is hesitate. Do not hesitate. Hesitation in drawing a sword will get you killed. If you have to draw the sword, use the sword. Hesitation will get you killed. Michael Dukakis, and I was glad for it, in 1988 ran for president. I think he would have lost anyway, but in the debates, he nailed the nail of his coffin in the election when he was asked at a debate what he would do if his wife was raped and her throat was slashed. Does he think the guy ought to get the death penalty or anything ought to happen to him? And he hesitated in answering. And he said himself later on, when I walked off the stage that night, I knew I'd lost the election. You knew why he knew? Because his manly instincts told him that he had so, was a, so afraid of offending liberals that he hesitated in the answer that he ought to have given. There should never be any hesitation about a husband or a father protecting his children, protecting his wife. There should never be any hesitation whatsoever. I'll tell you some of the saddest and most horrible stories you've ever read is when somebody has broken into a home. And done horrible things to a family. And you know, that may happen. But God help us to done, have done all we could do. And not to be looking back. I get the NRA magazine every month. And well, there's a page in there that's just full of stories where people have broken in and attempted to break in and were only stopped because somebody had a gun. And so I encourage you tonight that. That there's a time, young men, learn how to... I want to encourage you. Learn how to use a gun. Guns are dangerous. Guns are dangerous. You can shoot yourself or shoot somebody you love if you're not careful. They're not toys to be played with. You little kids, keep your hands off guns till your daddy teaches you how to use them. Be careful about putting your guns in places where your children can get a hold of them. Teach your children. Take the time to teach your children. Show them a gun. This is a gun, son. This thing's dangerous. It will kill you. You don't ever touch it. You don't play with it until I've trained you and teach you and tell you you can use it. They need to be taught how to hunt. You don't go walking across the field with your gun cocked up like this, walking behind the hunter in front of you. You have your gun pointed down all the time. Get them into safety training. Teach them what bullets goes and what guns. Go through this with them. I'm telling you, listen, uh, there are cases where little boys have saved their family's life because their dad got caught and taken advantage of and a young boy knew how to use a gun. There's just cases recently where women who had been trained to use a gun. Right now, uh, you gun, uh, the dentist, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but isn't the largest group of gun buyers right now women in America? Handgun purchases in America, largest group right now. Women are buying guns at unbelievable rates. 
You say, why? One of the reasons is because a lot of women do not have a husband that's there to protect them. They're living by themselves. They're single mothers or whatever. And second of all, there's an idea and an ideology. You know, it's funny that a lot of women, I suppose, according to the statistics, the majority of women in America are voting for liberal candidates. But it's funny, those are the very candidates that want to take away the protection that the women can provide for themselves. That's kind of doofy if you ask me. If I was a woman, I'd be a hardcore conservative. Gun-toting, amen? Me and Ben was down fixing fence one day, and this woman come up through the field, you know, and didn't know her. She's a neighbor of Ben's property there. She was walking up there. She's got a gun right down here. she got one of these leg guns, you know. Uh, and that funny thing about it was I never caught it till she almost walked up on us. But all she had to do was go, Boom. You know, and, and I'm just saying, I, I'm just telling you, I think women ought to know how to use guns. Amen. Now, I think women ought to cry out to the Lord, and I think men should cry out to the Lord. And I think we ought to do everything within our power to keep from having a confrontation or anything of that nature. But I'm saying I believe that there's a time for young men and men to draw the sword, and that is when your family or your loved ones are in, you have a right, responsibility, uh, to an obligation to protect those under your care. The second place tonight where young men draw the sword. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse number 15. Now, let me say this to you tonight as we get started. I said last week, and I don't know whether you caught it or not, but when I preached this message on drawing the sword, how many knows what other sword there is in the Bible, what, what other sword there is in your life? The Word of God. We used to call them sword drills. You know, they used to ask you a question and you jumped up and you had a sword drill. I think they have those down at camp. And you have a sword drill. But you know the truth about it is, and this is, I want to say something to the church tonight. One of the areas where I believe I have failed in, in pastoring and failed in my own family is real critical teaching of how to use the sword. You know, if we've got a gun up here tonight, we're having a class of how to use a gun. Uh, 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 there's a little gun I'm wanting to buy. Honey, I want to tell you what my Christmas wish is now. There's a little gun about this long up there at the gun store. It's about this long. And it looks like an Israeli Uzi. It's got a hundred rounds. It's a 223 with double hundred clips in it, double 50 clips. In it. It's got a hundred rounds. That thing's more fun. Would be more fun than a barrel of monkeys. But you know what? Before I use that thing very much, I need to learn how to use it. You know, I can have an AK-47 or an AR-15 up here, and if I don't know how to use that thing, it's worthless to me. I might have a grenade up here tonight, and I may have people coming at me, and if I don't know how to use the grenade, it is absolutely worthless to me. In fact, it could be dangerous to me if I don't know how to use it. I'm saying tonight, if I've got a judge pistol and I don't know how to turn the safety off and get the, that on, and I don't know how to use that gun, or if I don't know how to reload that gun, or if I don't know the kind of shells that goes in that gun, that thing is absolutely worthless to me. If you don't know how to use the sword of the Spirit tonight, it's worthless to you. Not worthless, but worthless to you, because it's not going to do you any good when you're in the spiritual warfare. And I want to encourage you tonight that one of the greatest things you'll ever know about the Bible is that Jesus Christ, when he was doing spiritual warfare with Satan, drew the sword and used it. Three times he said, it is written. And in every situation in life that you're going to face, you need to know Scripture, how to fight Satan and win. You can always, always, 110% of the time, whip Satan if you will use the sword of the Spirit. But our problem is we do not use it. We're using our own inclinations. We're using our own thoughts. If there was in this country a man in position in this nation, in a position of authority, who would use the sword, I would love to see a congressman. I would love to see a president. I would love to see a senator or a judge who would use the Bible in response to all the issues and the things that are being thrown out here. 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want to give you some things tonight. When to draw your sword. And uh, I think it'll help you. First Samuel chapter one. I'm sorry. Second Samuel, man alive. I knew that. I did that at home. Second Samuel chapter one. I did that at home, and I did it here. Can't believe I did that. Now let me give you the background here. David was anointed to be king of Israel. Saul uh, has been disobedient to God. Samuel told him. He said, "Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft." And David is anointed, and, and Saul actually winds up, the Bible said that Saul eyed David. Okay, now watch this. He eyed David. He got jealous of him. He hated of him. And Saul, at various points in, his, in David's life, tried to kill David. Isn't that right? He tried to kill him at various times. David eventually is put on the run. He's, put, he's, he's out with his men, and Saul literally has the army of Israel after David and his men. 
Now listen to this. Twice, twice, David could have killed Saul easily. Twice he had a spear right over the top of him when he didn't know he was there. And he could have killed him. Watch this. But he did not because he was the Lord's anointed. Now watch this passage of Scripture in relationship to that story. Verse number 15 of chapter 1, 2 Samuel. And David called one of the young men, underline that, one of his young men, and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Here's the story. David is out there in the battlefield. The, the Saul and his son had, and his armies had been fighting the Philistines. And, uh, and, and David and Saul is killed. Now, there's a little debate about how, whether this young man was telling the truth or whether he was trying to be a big hero. But he came running to David and he told David that, watch this, that he had slain Saul. He had killed Saul. I want to tell you something. It's pretty hard to defend people who's trying to kill you. If you read your Bible in verse 17, I'm not, well, let's just hit it a little bit. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. He sung a song of lamentation over Saul and his son after they were killed. And this is the man, Saul, who was trying to kill him repeatedly and whom he ha- could have killed but didn't. It says, also, he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jeshur, the beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. And you go all the way down through the end of that chapter, and that is a lamentation of David about the death of Saul, the man who tried to kill him, and whom twice he could have killed and did not. Now, isn't this interesting? Watch this. This young man, there's a young man comes to, to, to David, and he's bragging to David, I've destroyed your enemy. I've killed Saul. And David asked him who he is, and he said, I'm a Malachite. Now, it's very critical to understanding this. The Amalekites are in the Bible are a type of the flesh. They're a great study. But the Amalekites were always a type of the flesh and what the flesh will do and how the flesh will act. And this, this type of the flesh comes up to David in verse 14 and said unto him, uh, he told him about that. And David said in verse 14 unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Immediately, without any... Nothing. David turns to a young man, says, draw your sword and kill this Amalekite. Now, how, I want to ask you a question tonight. How would you, how well would you have done had you been a young man in Saul's army and, uh, and David's army? And you're standing here. This guy comes up. He's bragging to David, thinking David's going to be happy that he killed Saul. David says, take your sword and kill him. I want to ask you, would you have done it? Now, I want to tell you something about a sword's bloody business. You're talking about a man standing there. You're talking about pulling your sword out. I don't know whether you thrust him through the heart. I don't know whether you whack him across the neck. Where do you start butchering at? But David said, you do that. Now, there is a lesson here that every family, every individual better learn in this church. That there is a time to draw your sword, and that is when... People are against God-ordained and divinely appointed authority. And when they come against it, and they are trying to slay divinely appointed authority. I want to preach on this for just a little bit tonight. David knew something. You never, you never lift up your hand against divinely appointed authority. When David found out that Saul was killed, he didn't go, Amen, Amen, Saul's dead, I can be king. He said, you killed the man who killed that man. When David discovered that Amalekite had killed or, or claimed to have killed Saul, he had one to jump in to slay him. The Amalekite was slain because he dared, listen to this, he dared lift up his hand against God's anointed authority. Now, I'm going to give you something tonight about this series of messages on, the, on journey to biblical manhood that we need in this country. And I'm going to talk about this just a little bit because it's a plague in our churches. It's a plague. You need to get this down in your, to your boys and teach them this. Never, but never lift your hand against divinely appointed people in the ministry. Don't ever do it. David is a type of Christ, and I'm going to tell you something. The most sharp judgments that you've ever seen in your life come against people who lift their hands. David said, how was it that you were not afraid to lift your hand against divinely appointed authority? Kill him. We don't think it's very serious, but God showed me how serious this was. 
Let me give you a start off here. In the homes of this church, there's a divinely appointed authority, and he's called Daddy. Now, I want to tell you boys and you young people something here tonight. That your father in your home and your family is divinely appointed, and I don't care what you think of him. And if you allow, now here's when you need to draw your sword, boys. If you're standing in a group of boys back there, or you're out in this parking lot, or you're at some ball game, and somebody starts talking about your daddy, you need to draw your sword. Are you listening to me? He is divinely appointed authority in your home and your family, and you do not allow other people to sl- verbally slay your father or your mother. Amen. Thank you, Randy. And it will take some guts and some gumption and some backbone and some godly Christianity, but it will take biblical manhood more than anything I know to stop and say, you don't talk about my father that way. Because what these guys are doing, they're waiting to see if you're in rebellion in your own heart against your own father. See, if you're in rebellion against divinely appointed authority, if they sense that, they'll, they'll toss and they'll drop a few statements to see where you're at. You never go, the man who allows other people to mock, to ridicule, or to put down in any way his father is not a man, and he's certainly not a biblical man. You need to stand up for your daddy. I will tell you right here. My daddy's sitting back here. Don't ever talk bad about my daddy to me. I won't put up with it. I won't won't put up with you for two seconds. He is my divinely appointed authority. And I'm telling you something. God will curse me and my family if 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 I allow someone else to defame him. I am in big trouble with Almighty God. The divinely appointed leader of a church is your pastor. Now, you listen to me carefully tonight. I hardly ever preach on this. But I'm in it right now in this, this biblical manhood thing. I do not, I'm going to tell you first of all in preface to this, I do not care for preachers who are always batting around, touch not God's anointed, do my prophets no harm. Men have used that wrongly. It's true, but you don't, preachers don't need to go around batting it around. It's a fact in and of itself, and you don't use it to defend yourself. Okay? But I want to say this to you. Inside a church, there's the same basis of structure of authority that there is at your house. There's not a man in this house that ought to put up with his son or his daughter belittling his mother. Or talking bad or negatively about his mother. Is, am I right, guys, or not? You going to sit around and let your boys and your daughter talk bad about your mama? No, you should not. You know you shouldn't do that. Now, I want to tell you something. That same, there's a structure of a home, there's a structure of a church, and there's a structure of a government in the Bible. Those are three bases of authority. And you don't let your kids talk bad about their mama. You don't let your kids act disrespectful to their mama. You bring curse on your family. You bring curse on your family. And so I'm saying when you're in the church, you don't talk bad about other people in the church. You don't talk bad about... It, 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 I, I wish tonight I could just remove myself out of the pulpit and there'd be somebody else standing. I want to tell you, Brother Phil, you don't talk bad about them. You know, you, you take your sword. I never forget. I'll tell you one time I talked bad about, about a person who is in authority in church and a man of God said, Reggie, I ain't going to listen to no more of this. I'm done. I'm leaving. And that helped me. Yes, sir. That happened many, many years ago, but it helped me, Brother Phil. He said, Reggie, what you're, you're talking wrong stuff and I'm not listening. Woo! Conversation over. Huh? That was love, exactly. You know what else he was doing? He was doing me a giant favor by stopping my defilement. You draw your sword and rebuke when others try to slay the leaders of the work of God. Let me tell you something. I don't want somebody, I don't want anybody talking bad about our, about our, our, our Sunday school teachers. Don't you come to me running down our Sunday school. Don't come to me running down the school staff. Don't come running down the, 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 the janitor. I don't want to hear about it. I don't like what the janitor's doing. Don't run it. Don't come to me with it. If you're making an appeal, you want to talk, you, know, you say, hey, I, I see a problem, something wrong, or would like to discuss it, but don't, don't talk bad about it. This is destroying churches. It has destroyed churches. I'll get that a little bit. 
Dad always told me, he said, there's more than one way to kill a man. He said, more people have been killed with a tongue than been killed with a bullet. When someone starts to defile or defame someone in divinely appointed leadership, you do not hesitate to draw your sword. Now, I've been in some tough positions in my life. And I've had people, various people down through the years. And I, I'm just going to be honest with you, my brother Donnie, I've had people, I've had people hit me up. And I'm going to tell you why. I'll just tell you. My, my brother Donnie's been married before. I've had people come to me and say, he has no right to be teaching that pulpit. He's been, he's been, he's been married more than one time. That's not scriptural. That's not what the Bible said. He's not the pastor of this church. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. I have stood up for him and I've, I've said, not, to get back off. You're in wrong water now. Amen. He's not pastoring people. He's teaching the Christ. Now, it'd be, you know, we'd be all nice if we was all perfect and every none of us ever messed up. That's, you know. I've had people talk about people that come up to me and hit me about people that talk about people in this church and talk about, well, a whole bunch of, your church is full of divorcees. I said, that's right, amen, glory to God. I'm just the guy for them. I will tell you what, if we can't rebuild people and, 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 and things of that nature, we've got no business being here. We've got no message for anybody about anything. But I want to tell you something. You don't, well, listen, if God has put somebody in a position, the worst thing you can do is tear them down and start knocking them and, 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 and killing them with your, with your tongue. And, then, and, and this is what I'm saying. What, what, is, what was David doing? David was saying, this man has challenged God-ordained authority. Put him out. Amen. Don't allow others to defame your father. Don't allow them to defame your mother. Don't allow them to defame... You know, I ain't nobody or nothing, but it's the, past, it's the position. I'm, you, you may not respect me, but you ought to respect the, the, the position of the pastor. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I thought about this. Let me tell you why Ichabod is written across the doors of hundreds of churches. And I'm talking about all over this country right here. Let me tell you why. Because somebody got it in for the preacher. And they ran him off. And God wrote Ichabod across that door because they slew divine appointed authority. And God said, I'll never again bless that work. And let me tell you something. That's why right now they can't keep a pastor to save their life. Their church is a dead in last year's shucks. They can have their spring and fall revival. Nobody gets, there's no changes. The world's taking over their families. Let me tell you something. There were some good godly men. But later down the road, they got some challenging God-ordained authority. And God wrote Ichabod across their family. And now their families, their grandchildren are drug heads and in the jailhouse over here. Are you listening to me? You don't do that. You do not do that. It will destroy you spirits. They've got to write Ichabod across your head. There's been, let me tell you something. I, I, I mean, it's just, it is a cultural thing in the Ozarks, you know, about uh, uh, churches, you know, they're going to run a preacher off. We're going to vote him out. Y'all ever vote? I ain't paying no attention to your vote. I mean, to be honest with you, I'll tell you something. I, most, most churches are not run biblical to start with. You show me in the church where there's a church board. You show me in the Bible where there's a church board. They ain't. They ain't there. Are there deacons? Yes. Are there elders? Yes. But there's not a church board. Deacons are to help widows. They're to do the physical things that need to be done. Just this past week, I had three men. Three men of this church. I asked them, I said, i got a problem. I want you to deal with it. Come back to me with an answer. And they did, and it was a good answer. It was a good solution. And they took care of the business. It had to do with widows in the church. Now, I'm going to tell you something tonight. We don't have you know, official deacons. We probably ought to. But you know what we have? We have a lot of men that do the work of a deacon. And they don't, have, they don't have to go around having the title all the time. Has anybody ever noticed that I don't want reverend put in front of my name on funeral deals? I don't, I don't, I don't want, I'm not this and I ain't nothing. I'm just a servant of the Lord. But I'm saying to you this. Uh, there's hundreds of, hundreds of churches and families in this area They've raised their hand against the Lord's anointing. God cursed that church and cursed the families. And now generational death is going to their children and their grandchildren. Don't allow your family to lift up their hand against the divine authority and talk bad about God's servants. It'll, it'll mess you up forever. Number two, go to first, Second Samuel. That's, that's pretty serious business now. Amen? You don't mess with that. By the way, God can take care of people, His people who do wrong, without my help. Second Samuel chapter 18, verse number 15, the Bible said, watch this here. Now, what you got here is a situation of a man who's a rebel. Now, you boys hang on your head. I'm trying, I'm trying to give you something out of the Bible. Bible principles, okay? Look at verse number 15, chapter 18. Everybody there say amen. 
Don't all soul up on me now. Just stay in the back. Stay in the deal here. God wants to help us. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand, at verse 14, and thrust them through the heart of Absalom, while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And then, and ten young men that bared Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. Now, you know what you got here? You got ten young men. Now, Absalom wasn't nobody's monkey. Let me tell you something about Absalom. He was David's son, but he had a problem. Anybody know what it was? He was a, re- he was a rebel. Are you listening to me? He was a rebel. First thing is, draw your sword against people who, have, who will physically affect your family. Trying to hurt your family. Second of all, draw your sword against those who are in rebellion against divine authority. And thirdly, draw your sword against those who are in rebellion. You see this pattern? You say, how do you do that? That means you don't put up with boys that are in, are in rebellion against their father or rebellion against God or girls. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. They, oh, oh, Joab said, you boys, kill him. What was he doing? He was training young men when and how to draw the sword against those that needed the sword drawn against them. Can I tell you something? The worst thing you'll ever do is just pity patty around with somebody in rebellion. Hey, in this church, are you listening to me tonight? I'm your pastor. I love you. I love every one of you. Love you with all my heart. But did you know that in any given time in this church, there's rebellion, rebellion. Here and there and yonder, rebellion. And the devil putting rebellion in people's hearts. And your children, though you walk in this church, don't you get out of your car, walk through this door and think your kids are safe from somebody influencing them with rebellion. Don't you send your kids to this school and think that your kids are down here safe from rebellion. There are rebels being raised up anywhere and any family in every home has the potential to have a rebel in it. Now here's the lesson. God is saying, draw your sword. I'm not talking about the steel sword. I'm talking about the sword of the Spirit against a fellow, re- against a fellow, uh, uh, maybe a friend or, or acquaintance who is in rebellion. If you don't, they'll get you. They'll have you. Rebel- rebels will try to spread their rebellion among other people. Biblical men do not tolerate a rebel. Let me tell you something. Old, old brother Fields up there. I said in him, if you've heard this a thousand times, but he sat there with that family and they had that girl. Now you're listening to me tonight. He said, he said, you've asked me what to do with this girl. He said, I'll tell you, put her out of her house, pack her suitcase, put it in the middle of the street and get her out of your house because if you don't, she's going to poison the rest of your kids. She's a rebel. What was he doing? Drawing the sword, put her out, cut her off. For she poisons everybody else in your house. Can I tell you girls something tonight? One of you girls starts being a rebel against Almighty God. If you, God, you girls love God, you get away from her. And I don't care if she goes home and says, Mama, they won't talk to me. I want to tell you something. You say, all right, you start living for God and quit talking nasty and quit talking junk and quit being red rebellious. I'll be your friend. I love you. I want to help you. You're not being an enemy. You're helping them. You boys, some of these boys, you sit around out here and you realize there's rebellion in that boy's heart. You draw the sword. You don't be afraid to do that. You don't t- stand for that stuff. You don't go along with rebellion. It's infectious. And men who perceive, when you perceive rebellion in another, stand against it. Hey, fathers, when you perceive rebellion in your children, deal with it. Amen. Go to Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. Drawing the sword. When do you draw the sword? Let me tell you what's wrong with this country. This, you, know, you, know, you know what's really wrong with this country? This country can't take preaching. That's the deal with this country. Can't take preaching. Let me tell you about preaching. Preaching's not a dialogue. Preaching isn't to meet me and you sitting around the table. You know what preaching is? Preaching is me getting up here and preaching the Word of God. And based upon the Word of God, and with authority of the Word of God, and you either like it, don't like it, receive it, or reject it, you have your choice. But let me tell you something. You, you can choose your choice, but you cannot choose the consequences of your choice. Amen. Are you listening? You cannot choose the consequences of your choice. You may make the choice, but you don't choose the consequences of your choice. God has ordained preaching. Tell you what, we've got too many dialogues and too many sitting around Fox News group around here. And this is my opinion. You know, what the, you know what the difference between preaching and teaching is? Preaching says this is the way it is, whether you like it or not. And it's not my opinion, not your opinion. And this is what gets people in trouble. I'll tell you, there's the authority. Of the, it has to do with the authority of the Word of God. Let me tell you, first of all, a lot of young men will idolize rebellion. 
instead of standing against it. Don't ever idolize or think something. You can have a boy come into a church group or a school and he's rebellious and if he's kind of good looking or he's pretty, he's pretty suave or whatever, the first thing you know, all the boys in that school want to act like him. I can take you through American history. James Dean. They cocked him up, combed his hair, and made he, and he and taught and he had this cocky, you know, smirky attitude. And the whole United States wanted to look and act like James Dean. Back in the fifties, he was a startup of rock and roll, and rock and roll was full of rebellion. Judges chapter eight, verse number twenty. Boy, this amazing story right here. This will help you. Background Gideon. He is in warfare against the two Midianite kings. He's fighting. He's conquering for Israel. He's trying to get Israel out from underneath bondage and out from underneath slavery. He has a firstborn son. Look at verse number 20. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn. All right, everybody catching this? Here's a daddy with his firstborn son with him in battle. Watch this. He said unto Jethro, his first one, up and slay them. Now, this was the two Midianite kings. You know what he did? Gideon said, son, get up. Take your sword. Kill those two kings. Now, you read this passage of Scripture. But, his, but the youth, Jether, drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Can I tell you the sins that you won't destroy is the sins that's going to destroy you. And you're going to have to stand against some things. And you have to do some business that you don't enjoy doing. And you know what his daddy had to do? If you read that passage of Scripture, in fact, verse number 20, verse number... Uh, Anyway, they basically mocked him. I can't find my verse right now. Then Z- Here it is, verse 21. Then Zeba and Zalmua, these are the two Midianite kings, said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. Can you imagine these two men? They mocked Jether, Gideon's son. and said, Come on, little boy. What's the matter with you? You ain't got the guts. And get, watch this, verse 21. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmua. And took away the ornaments that were on their, on their camel's necks. His daddy had to get up and take care of the evil. Here's what I'm talking about. Don't ever be afraid to draw your sword against evil. He was young. Gideon had to do it. Let me give you an illustration that comes to my mind. I'm not recommending the movie, the film, but there's a film called Saving Private Ryan. How many ever seen it besides me? Raise your hand. Okay. Not saying I recommend it. But I do, uh, there's a lot of that movie I do appreciate. In that movie, this patrol is sent out to go find this third son of this woman who's had two other sons dead. They just bring him back, get him out of the battlefield, right? They're coming up through an area there, and they hit a machine gun nest at a, radi- at a ra- radar installation. And they know they've got to take it out. So they start making their moves, and they take it out. But in the process, one of their men are killed, and they wind up with a living German soldier. Now, they can't take him back as prisoner. They don't have the men. And they know this German soldier knows where they're at. And they're in dangerous behind enemy lines. And they're getting ready to kill him. And this little guy that's on the patrol that was sent along right at the last moment, who was a typist, wimps out and talks the whole group out of not killing him. We can't kill him. He's not. He, he, he's a prisoner of war. That's against Geneva Convention. He goes on about by his excuses, his little bit of excuses why they shouldn't kill him. And they almost kill each other. Now, you've, you've seen that this thing is this thing. That's why that's why this movie Master Son is because they almost kill each other over this guy. They almost kill each other. I mean, there are pistols drawn at fellow soldiers who've been brothers because many of them know that if they don't kill this guy, it's going to cost them. But in the end. They, they caved into this wimpy guy, put a blindfold on this German soldier, and sent him walking toward their troops, hoping maybe, you know, that some of their troops might pick him up. The next time, does anybody know where the next time they see that guy at? He's killing Americans. Because they didn't kill him. 
You listen to me. There are situations in your life you better draw the sword on and you better get rid of what the devil's sending your way and you better deal with this thing and you better not spare not. And you say, oh my goodness sakes, you know, I don't know about this. There's things you better deal with in your, in your life. If you don't draw your sword against your own evil, your own sin, that sin's going to come back and you're going to see a gun barrel pointing right, at your, right between your eyeballs. You want to find out that which you did not destroy is going to destroy you. The second situation in that movie where the same man messed up was they were in that town waiting on the, defending a bridge that they were supposed to hold. And they got men up in the upstairs of a building up there. And this guy's been given instructions. You're to keep the ammo to everybody. And whenever they holler, you get that ammo to them. And those guys ran out of ammunition up there. And they started screaming and hollering, get the ammo up here. Get the ammo up here. Get the ammo up here. And this guy so wimps out, he stands and starts shaking. He doesn't go anywhere. And while he's standing there with ammo strapped all over his neck that could have saved those men's lives, those Germans run up through there and they cut the guts that put a knife through one of the American soldiers' hearts. And he's sitting there trembling against the wall because he's afraid to draw his sword. He could have pulled his pistol out and shot him. But he let him kill his own fellow soldiers. What I'm saying to you is this, is there's a time to draw your sword. There's a time to, there's a time to say, you know what, we ain't putting up with this. This ain't right, and it's not, it's not going to stand. Draw your sword. It may be in your home, it may be in your marriage, it may be in your family. In the areas of your life. The biggest thing that hurts you, that'll get you, is when you didn't draw the sword in places where you should have done it. Let me tell you something. You're living in an evil, wicked world. You're dealing with nasty, horrible flesh. Your flesh, your Amalekite, will kill you if he gets a chance. He will destroy you spiritually if he has the least opportunity. Learn to draw the sword. Do you know something interesting? Uh, you can go check in concordance, make sure I'm accurate on this. But if I'm right, Jether, Gideon's son, is never mentioned again in Scripture. It's over with with him. God says, don't use him. He's a fearful man, afraid to draw a sword. Learn to draw the sword in spiritual warfare, as I said earlier. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, it is written. Hebrews said that the Bible is sharper and quicker and sharper and powerful than any two-edged sword. And the mockers and haters of God are the enemies of righteousness, and we need to draw our sword. Let me tell you something. There's people all of America who hate God. We need to draw the sword. We need men who draw the sword of truth against the evil of our day. The Bible is what counts, not what I think, not my opinion, but what does saith the Lord. The other night, the man was coming out of that deal up there at the uh, plant. Zach had a verse put up on the Bible, if a man will not work, neither should he eat. Steel letters up on the wall. A man walked out there, he's an elderly man. In fact, he's old. And he said, stop, and he said, Reggie, I'll tell you something. He said, I read that verse up on the wall. He said, this whole nation needs to read that verse. If a man will not work, and I want to say, I appreciate my boys putting Bible verses. They put it in the concrete, and they put it up on the walls. Because they want people to know that the Lord is in charge of this place. Whatever it is or whatever it isn't, it belongs to the Lord. Don't be afraid to draw your sword against evil. That's what I'm trying to preach to you tonight. Whether it's physical evil or whether it's spiritual evil, don't be afraid to draw it. Don't be afraid to deal with it. Finally tonight, I want to move to another thing and, and we'll go home. A biblical man will seek and obey counsel from his elders and not his peers. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse number 8, you remember the story where Rehoboam went to the old men first. You boys listen to this. My daddy's sitting right back there tonight and God showed me something this afternoon. That I, daddy, I understood this afternoon why I, didn't, I, never, listened, I never got your counsel. The Bible said that a man of understanding will, will, will seek... I want to get the verse right. I'm trying to learn it. Here it is. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. You know what my problem was, Daddy, and has been all my life? I'll seek counsel as long as the counsel is what I want to hear. And I'll seek counsel... But the Bible tell, tells you that when you find somebody that you need to get counsel from, you have to draw it out. It doesn't pour out on its own. You have to draw it out. And I could remember and can right now while I'm speaking remember specific times when I asked my father about something and he would give me a 
it was I, I would have had to draw it out. It was there, but God has so ordained it that if you don't just want it, you ain't going to get it. You're going to have to draw it out. Did you know to get counsel from the Bible, you're going to have to draw it out? You cannot casually read your Bible and really draw out wisdom and counsel about what you ought to do in a given situation. You see, the Lord just doesn't write down, well, you should do this on certain such day and you shouldn't do this on certain such day and this little issue here and this little issue there. Did you know you're going to have to read your Bible and you're going to have to study your Bible and start getting the principle of the Word of God and pretty soon the Holy Spirit will draw that wisdom and draw that counsel out for you. But Rehoboam, now watch this, and we're going to go home. Rehoboam went and talked to the elder men. What did they tell him? They said, don't tax the people heavy. They'll support you. They'll be with you and be all right. What did he do? He ran to the, to the young men, his peers, his buddies, and he got counsel from his friends. And they called him otherwise, and he heeded the counsel of the young people. To be a biblical man, you want to get counsel from older, wiser men in your life. That led to national destruction. It led to the destruction of his kingdom. And I want to just say something to us tonight. Never allow a buddy or friend's opinion to trump your parents or your dad's advice. Never allow your friend's opinions to trump or override your daddy's advice. Your mama's for that way. Young men, the, uh, uh, you remember when the young man, the Bible talk, says he's a young man, that Elisha had, and he couldn't see, that he said, well, what are we going to do? And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. You know there's a great spiritual truth in there? Yo, I want to tell you boys, this. remember, there's Elisha, and there's his helper, and he was a young man. Did you watch this? Here's the great truth. The, the older man could see the chariots of fire and could see the horses, but the young man couldn't. You know what that tells you? is that an older man will see the things of God and see the wisdom of God and know the ways of God, and he'll see things that a young man can't even possibly see. Oh, get the counsel from old men and, and elderly men and obey it. You may choose what you're going to do again, but you don't get to choose the consequences. Go to your father. Go to your grandfather. Go to the, there's some men in this church that would, could, would be glad, you know, and be helpful to you and give you wise counsel about things in life. They're valuable sources of wisdom and you ought to use it. Stay clear, though, of those who are super quick to want to give you advice that's usually not worth very much. That's, why, that's how God tells you. If you have to draw it out, it'll be worth something. If they spill it out, it's usually not worth much. Proverbs 15:22 says, "Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, there's, they're established." Proverbs 24:6 says, "By wise counsel, make war, and in the multitude of counselors, there's safety." Proverbs 12:15 says, "The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise." And so, I want to say to us tonight: If we're going to be biblical men, we need to know when to draw our sword, when not to draw our sword, against what, against who, and when. And we need to listen to counsel and get advice from people before the people that know the Lord and that are older than us. Or we're going to miss the boat. I, 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 feel, you, I, I think you're all tired and wore out. And I've kept you longer than all to keep you. Love you. Let's stand and go home tonight. Lord, I remember what Solomon said whenever he was... Taking the throne, Lord, he said, I am but a child. I know not how to go in nor to come out. And Lord, he asked you for wisdom. God, we pray tonight that you'd help us to not be as Jether, to be afraid to draw the sword against evil. Lord, there are many enemies of the gospel, enemies of the truth, enemies of righteousness. And God, I'll tell you, this country is full of men who are afraid to use the Bible. Even in our conversations, we won't dare quote a verse of Scripture. God, forgive us of it. Help us to use the Word of God, to speak as of the oracles of God. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd help us all, Lord, to realize the great principle, Lord, of uh, not going against God-ordained authority. Whether it be our parents or those in church, Lord, or whatever it might be. Help us, God, not to have that curse upon us. I pray, keep it from us. Lord, help us not to think we're something if we are an authority. And help us not to use or abuse authority. I pray, God, tonight that you'd help us to take our sword against evil in every situation and to use the Word of God. I pray, Lord, help us to 
listen to the counsel of the elderly rather than our friends or peers, Heavenly Father, who don't have the Word of God in them. And so, Lord, we just pray tonight that you'd help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ into biblical manhood. And, Lord, I do ask tonight, Lord, I know that, Lord, that we can watch, but we watch in vain if the Lord doesn't keep the house. And Lord, I pray that you would divinely protect every family here, Lord, from physical harm. I pray you'd protect them from spiritual harm. And, Lord, help us fathers to protect our children, to be chivalrous, Lord, to protect our children, the weak and the wounded. And, Lord, to be the biblical men in this country and help us, God, to be something that folks could see and they'd say that's what a man ought to be. And, Lord, I pray that you take away our pride, take away, Lord, the junk that would keep us from getting the grace of God to be what we ought to be. Bless these people now, Lord. Give them a good week. I pray, Lord, that thy peace and thy rest and thy joy would be upon them. And, Lord, we do again lift up to you tonight, Sister and Brother Adams. Help them, strengthen them. Lord, take them through this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good night to you. Have a great week.